Malachi chapter 2, we'll read together verse 1 to 4. Okay, kunara na, Malachi 2, verse 1, ready, go. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my names, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. How shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. O Lord, illuminate my dark understanding to receive your word and prudently retain it. Give me grace that the seed of your word being sown in my heart, it may take deep root downward and bring forth fruit upward to the credit of your gospel, the comfort of my poor soul, and above all, to the glory of your most holy name. That your spirit rule and guide the lips of your minister, that he may utter nothing but the word of truth, with that fervency that neither fear nor affection may stop the current of the same. And because the harvest is great and the laborers but few, I beseech you who are Lord of the harvest to send forth such into your vineyard as may with a zeal discharge their ministerial function. Let your urim be upon them as upon your holy ones, that sincerity of doctrine and integrity of conversation may adorn their persons. Lord, guide the heart and tongue of him whom I shall hear this day. Grant he may, grant he may speak home to my conscience and leave no corruption and bowel, but that his words may chase away all sinful affections from me, whereby I may depart from all iniquity. Bless all your people and grant that they may not be only hearers of your word, but doers of the same, not deceiving their own souls. And grant that your messengers, dividing the word aright, and your people keeping it carefully and practicing it conscionably, they may, through Jesus Christ, obtain the remission of their sins past and receive your grace for the time to come. Give them light instead of darkness peace for trouble, and eternal happiness instead of felicity, that tasting the sweetness of celestial comfort, they may despise the earth, and after this life ended, they may enter into everlasting glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. A pastor pleasantly surprised his congregation by delivering a 10-minute sermon instead of his usual 30-minute message in concluding, he explained, I regret to inform you, brethren, that my dog, who appears to be inordinately fond of paper, this morning ate that portion of my sermon, which I have not delivered. Let us pray. After the service, a stranger from another church approached the pastor and said, Preacher, please let me know if that dog of yours has any puppies. If it does, I want to buy one for my pastor. Now, um, Di malas ka mo, kaya huwag kong gagamit papel. And wala kami ido para magkaon sang papel. But I started with this because our message today will still center on spiritual leaders. What kind of a spiritual leader or a pastor are you looking for? So if a church gives you the responsibility to find a new pastor for your church, what would you look for? Is it a, it's, is it a pastor who is good with preaching and teaching? Should he be a person who is relational, that is good with people? Is he someone who is a dynamic leader, able to mobilize and to inspire everyone to serve? Because the question for this morning is this, what is one of the root causes of empty and, accept, and unacceptable worship to God? Okay, so what is one of the root causes of empty and acceptable worship to God? Because there are many causes for our empty and acceptable worship. Last Sunday, we learned it came from a defective heart. God hates what they are offering. 
But it's not just the offering per se. That offering comes from a polluted heart, a defective heart. But it seems that the focus of God in chapter 2, verse 1 to 9, is with a certain group of people, namely the spiritual leaders of Israel, that is being one of the main causes. It's not the only cause, but it seems that because God is targeting them, it tells me that they are one of the root causes for the empty worship and the unacceptable sacrifices of God's people. What did these spiritual leaders do? And so if we asked last time, what is the kind of worship that God hates? Or what is the kind of worship that God looks for? Today we will ask, what is the kind of spiritual leadership that God hates or that pleases Him? God focused on the priest, but it would also benefit us to look at this and learn what kind of spiritual leaders that God is looking for. Because here Malachi recognizes that all people were, were guilty of dishonoring God. It's not just the priest. But all people are guilty as revealed in the offerings that they bring. Nevertheless, he focuses on Israel's priest because it is their responsibility to guard the temple from defilement and to inspect all sacrifices as to, as to exclude, for example, blind, lame, or sick animals. That's why verse 1 of chapter 2 starts by saying, And now, O, o priest. Now, a major reason for the Lord's anger with Israel is the priesthood's attitude towards God's name at the altar and towards, toward God's law. So whether it's the altar, the offerings that they bring, or how they treat God's law, whether in teaching the law or judging according to the law, at the altar, they offer deceased or imperfect animals in sacrifice, thereby reversing the intent of their labors and bringing curse and defilement where they should bring blessing and cleansing. In their teaching and judging, they violate the covenant that God made with Levi, showing partiality and causing many to stumble. Now, let me remind you, just because God affirmed His unconditional love for them in chapter 1 did not absolve their guilt. So Malachi here delivered an opening accusation against the priests, the nation's spiritual leaders, pointing out how they are showing hatred, contempt, for God's sacrifices, His glory, and His law. That's why verse 1, And now, O priest, this command is for you. I want to make clear, I'm commanding you this. The priests are supposed to be the representatives of the people as well as their leaders. The following verses show how they fail to act in accordance with their calling as priests. Verse 2, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart, what will happen to them? If the priest would not hear and repent, God promised to curse their blessings. What is this blessing that God will curse? Either it's the physical and material blessings promised to the priest who receive the people's tithes. Many last will do as people tithes, um, they will receive it materially whether their share of the animal sacrifice or the food offering or the money. So God said, I will curse your material blessing that is supposed to be yours. That's why Numbers 18 to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel. It will be their sustenance. It will be their sueldo. It, it is by the means that they will survive. It is the way they live. But secondly, God will either also pronounce a curse upon the pronouncement of blessing that the priests give at the time of the sacrifices. So I realize it's not only the people who are bringing tithes to sustain the priest, but as they sacrifice to the Lord, usually the priest would also pronounce blessing. Number six, this is the blessing that they pronounce. As they give their sacrifice, the Lord bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you. However, because they failed God, God would even, if this is true, the pronouncement of blessing will in turn become a curse. 
Because failing to render glory to God will result in a curse being sent upon them. This is a fundamental Old Testament theme. If you obey God, you will be blessed. If you disobey God, you will be cursed. But I think the heart of the matter here is in verse 2. If you will not take it to heart. Their sin all went back to a hollow formalism. They keep up the appearances, but it's hollow. It's empty. It was a religion of surface emotions and outward signs, but it was not of the heart. That's why God said, I will not only curse you, I will also rebuke your offspring. Now, literally, this is rebuking your seed, which could mean a curse upon the offering of, or the children of the priest, their seed, or literally on their agricultural seed, or it could be both. I will curse your children. I will curse your crops. I hate you. I reject you. I will punish you. Why? You failed to obey me. Worse than that, God will not just either curse their children or their crops. Worse yet, verse 3, look at your Bibles. I will spread dung on your faces. God will also spread feces on their faces. What is this dung? Now, actually, this refers to the intestines of the animals. Kagang kasudlan na still has excretory contents, which is a byproduct of the sacrificial contents. Politely, this is higgo. Impolitely, this is. I don't want to say it. Because sacrificed animals still had excrement in their system. And God said, to be able to do this, before you sacrifice the animal, you should burn the, the intestines or the inward parts of the animal outside the camp. Don't do it on the altar. Because if you lay that animal on the altar, it's not a good odor. Exodus 29, the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung. You shall burn with fire outside the camp. Now, while the smell of the meat on the grill is good, and that is how, I don't know, how animal sacrifice is supposed to work, God meant this sacrificial system, especially in offering burnt offerings, which is a slain animal, to be a clear picture of how dirty, messy, and deadly sin is. Just compare the way we worship with the way Israelites worship. Paano tayo mag-worship? On Sunday, we, we take a bath, we put on our best clothes, we come to church, we sing songs, we listen to a sermon, we pray, we read scripture, we eat, and that's it. If they bring something to God, if they worship God, part of that is singing. But major part of that is they bring their animals to God. They don't come empty-handed, especially if they have sins. And so as they bring the animal, that animal has to be killed in front of the one offering. The blood is spilled. Is that clean? No. Animal parts get segregated. So part of the work of the Levites and the priest is to be butchers. Sila pa nang malasa sang, sang sapat. Each part segregated, laid on the altar with fire. The meat hits the grill and it becomes a sweet-smelling savor. sila as they worship God. The priest will get to eat that. Some sacrifices ang nag-offer will eat that meal together in the presence of God. But... The inside parts with all its waste separated and burned elsewhere. Is that a pleasant sight as you worship? I don't think so. We go, we go to the market. It's like you go to worship in a slaughterhouse. But God said, this insides and the dung supposed to be separated and burnt outside but god said i would spread this dung on your faces so you would have to be taken outside the camp now in preaching we are taught to never be disgusting disgusting with the words you use or be disrespectful with the language we use but here god is intentional in speaking this way that's how the Ilunggo is supposed to sound like. 
This, is, this very graphic language shows how God viewed unfaithful priests as worthy of the most unthinkable disgrace. So as the internal waste of the sacrificial animal was normally carried outside the camp and burned, so the priest would be discarded and suffer humiliation and loss of office. It's not about that. But God is picturing these priests, unacceptable priests, like dung, like excrement, like waste, animal waste, that God will discard and God will remove. The Lord's purpose in such a warning was to shake them out of their complacency because they thought that everything seems normal. They do their work mechanically. They do their work hollowly with no heart in it. That's why God has to give them such graphic warning. That's why verse 4 says, Then you will know that I have sent this command with you. The priest will know the price of disobedience by a bitter experience with the consequences when God has rejected and humiliated them. And I also want you to know, verse 4 and 5, that God's covenant with Levi may stand. Now, the relationship of God to the priesthood was, was clearly set forth in the agreement He made with the tribe of Levi. And He wants this faith, unfaithful priest to know this. Number 3, God clearly said, the Levites are mine. So instead of taking the firstborn from every family, I'm saying, you know, redeem them and the Levite will stand in your place. Okay, that's why the people are obligated to give their tithes. Why? Because instead of God conscripting their firstborn, requiring their firstborn to serve Him, God instead took all the Levites to serve in their place. And the covenant language God used here is similar to the covenant He made with Phinehas relating to the lineage of the high priest which entitled them to a hereditary priesthood. So I'm saying, you know, the priesthood will not come from any other family other than Levi and Aaron. This shows the motive for God's discipline of these ungodly priests. The Lord hoped that this would warn the priest to properly respect his covenant. Now, the Jewish priests of Malachi's day had deceived themselves by claiming the privileges of the covenant while neglecting the conditions of it. They want the blessing without the condition, as if God was bound to bless them even while they rejected the obligation to serve Him with a holy and obedient heart. Jeremiah, God said, if you can break my covenant with the day and night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David may be broken. What is God saying here? As long as there's day and night, my faithfulness will not cease. My, my faithfulness with the, uh, with the covenant I made with David and the covenant I made with the Levites. So nagsalig sila. Oh God, you will be faithful to your covenant with us. So no matter how we behave, you will still bless us. You are bound to be faithful. But the covenant was of one, was one of mutual responsibility in which God expected reverence for himself in exchange for life and peace for the priest. That's why Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, who is the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, God said, he turned back my wrath from the people of Israel. How? He was jealous with my jealousy among them. What did Phinehas do? He saw Israel as is in the verge of committing idolatry. He eliminated those who incited this sinful act before God. That's why God commended Phinehas. He said, Phinehas was zealous for my righteousness. Therefore, I, I said to him, I give to him my covenant of peace because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So God's promise to him is what? The perpetual priesthood will be yours and your family alone. Our first lesson here is this. God is faithful to His covenant, but He will reject those who fail to follow the mutual responsibility of obeying Him with all their hearts, starting with the spiritual leaders.
Now, God has always been faithful to His covenant. Whether it's with Abraham, with Israel, with David, and here with Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the high priest. But the priests of Malachi's day just wanted the blessing of God, yet were unwilling to live up to the condition of their responsibility to listen to God and to obey Him with all their hearts. So since the priests failed to guard the purity of the, the temple, the Lord threatened to punish them in a manner that fits their crime. Because they polluted God in verse 7 of chapter 1, He will figuratively pollute and disqualify them for service at the altar by spreading on their faces dung taken from their rejected sacrifices. So since that dung was to be taken away from the sanctuary and burned, so they too will be taken away. This is God rejecting them. Because they presumed to bless the people of God as if Israel's sacrifices had been accepted and atonement made. But God said, I will curse your blessings. Whether the sacrifice you bring or the blessing you pronounce on the people, you're unacceptable to me. As Matthew Henry put it, he said, Nothing profanes the name of God more than the misconduct of those whose business is to do honor to it. Whose business is that? It starts with our spiritual leaders. And nothing disrespects the name of God more than the misconduct of our leaders. This is why the office and the work of a spiritual leader must not be taken lightly. Just because you win the votes of the members or receive a call to be the pastor or a church leader doesn't automatically mean you are already fit for the office and for the job. Much more, let me tell you this, just because you finish or you graduated from a seminary doesn't mean that you're automatically qualified to be a pastor. You attended classes for four years, nakapasar ka, nakatoga ka, nakagraduar ka, and you are a seminary graduate, but you are not automatically fit to be a pastor. That's why you must be spiritually qualified and must live a life that is worthy of the office and the work. Because there's a lot at stake here. No wonder why the sin or the failures of a spiritual leader is weightier than the sins of others. It's more grievous than, than the sins of others. Our members can commit sin, and any sin we commit, it has gravity to it, it has sadness that comes with it, it is painful, but nothing profanes the name of God more than the misconduct of our spiritual leaders. That's why these leaders presume that just because God is faithful, no matter how we behave, ah, business as usual na niya gyapon. No matter what kind of life I live on Sunday, I put on my ministerial face, ministerial look. No matter how I live, God will be faithful when in fact He said to them, I will reject you because you have the responsibility to obey me with all your hearts. And that obedience that comes from the heart should start with our leaders. Verse 5, My covenant with Levi was one of life and peace, and I gave it to him. Now some see in the covenant of peace here as an allusion to the covenant that God made with... It's like the exact same words. God gave his covenant of peace to Phinehas who pleased him. So God promised Levi that his descendants would be scattered in, in Israel. So while many of the Levites will be stationed in Jerusalem because they would serve God in the tabernacle and in the temple, many of them will be scattered throughout Israel. Why? Because it was their responsibility to teach the law, to uphold the law, and to exemplify it. So God's knowledge was meant to be spread. God's law was meant to be observed everywhere, not just in Jerusalem. But the central thrust of Deuteronomy is to show the connection between covenant obedience and life. Commitment to God leads to a full life. That's why God said, my covenant with Him was one of life and peace. Only if they obey me, they will have a full life. 
It was a covenant of fear, so Levi feared me. So here God used Levi as an example for the priest in Malachi's day. Because Levi here, I think, is more likely speaking of Phinehas or Aaron for that matter. Number one, Levi was shown to be an example of reverence. He feared God and stood in awe of his name, unlike the priest of Malachi's day. Having no fear for God, Levi know or knew God's word. True instruction was in his mouth or the law of truth was in his mouth. The priest had a special responsibility to study and spread the word of God. That's why in 2 Chronicles 31, God said, the people who live in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priest and the Levites. Why? They might give themselves to the law of the Lord. Now, this is similar to God's servants who devote themselves full-time to the studying and teaching the Word of God. We call them pastors, teachers who ought to be supported. That's why in the Old Testament, God said, um, you people of Israel, you must give your tithes or your portion that is due to the priests, so that they can focus full-time in studying and teaching the law of God. Similarly, in the New Testament, Thirdly, Levi is an example of godly character. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. Aaron also fulfilled this responsibility and lived the godliness he taught. So he preserved and promoted God's word. God's servant should guard knowledge and people would see that knowledge enough that they would seek instruction from your mouth. So your teaching is that attractive that people would want to learn from you. And the reason here is this, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now take note that the word translated messenger here is elsewhere translated in Greek as angelos or angel or messenger or malak of the Lord or malachi, underlining the authority with which the priests speak. So God is saying to this priest through Malachi, you were supposed to be my Malachi. You were supposed to be my messengers because you are my messengers in Israel. Because not only will they were to represent the people to God through the sacrifices, but they were also responsible to represent God to the people by teaching the law of Moses to the nations. Second lesson. Spiritual leaders that please God should not only be knowledgeable messengers, but also preservers and promoters of His Word through their godly lives. Spiritual leaders should be knowledgeable messengers. Because the priests had to study and to spread God's word, they had to do it with knowledge so the people could seek the law from his mouth. They should be knowledgeable messengers of God's word. Doctors should be well-versed in treating their patients. Would you trust a surgeon to treat you if he had not gone to school and know how to do an operation? Pilots should be well-versed in flying a plane. Mechanics should be well-versed in fixing a car. Teachers should be well-versed in their lessons. And one comment that I hate to hear from any member to be said to their pastor is this, Pastor, you are good with something else other than your Bible. In fact, I've heard one, my friend told me, Pastor, you're better with fixing computers than with teaching the Bible. That's a low-key, straight-up insult. So the connection between the true knowledge of the Lord and the priestly instruction in the law is set clearly in 2 Chronicles 15.3 when God said, for a long time Israel was without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without the law. This is a sad description of any people to claim to be the people of God. And many churches are in this condition. They they are without a true God because they have no one teaching them right. 
and no one upholding His law. Now, just try to substitute it with the name of your church. For a long time in Bangyai, there was no true God, there was no teaching pastor, and without the law. Is this a description of your home church or a church that you know? Because providing this instruction is the first task of the priest, and they cannot do it if they are not well versed in God's word. Deuteronomy 33, God said, They shall teach Israel your rules and your law. So there are twofold responsibility of the priest. They shall put incense and burn offerings on God's altar. That is the, the priest representing the people before God. They bring the offering in behalf of the people, but they are also to represent God before the people through their teaching. But it does not end there. They should also preserve and promote God's word through their godly lives. It's not enough that they would be knowledgeable. They ought to live according to what they preach. Because here is where the rubber meets the road, where the true test of their knowledge lies. Because a spiritual leader, a Bible teacher, can be well-versed. He can be so brilliant, so bright, knows how to preach, knows how to teach. But they will fail to promote God's word that he teaches because he does not live according to it. That's why Hosea 4, God said, my people are destroyed. Why? They don't know anything. They lack knowledge. Why do they lack knowledge? Because you, O oh priest, have rejected knowledge. So I reject you from being priest to me. And since you've forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Now, I love how God is simplistic and straightforward with what He is saying here. Yes, He, displeased, he is displeased with disobedience. He expresses His anger against rebellion. But reject Him, He will just reject you. Forget Him, He will also forget you even though you are a priest. So, spiritual leaders that please God, should be knowledgeable they ought to know something they ought to be well versed they ought to study what they teach but they have to also live out in that way they preserve and promote god's word through their godly lives that what they teach also lines up with how they live it does not contradict However, verse 8, God said, But you have turned aside from the way. Coming from the thoughts of the ideal spiritual leaders that God is looking for since verse 4 to verse 7, through the example of God's covenant with Levi through Aaron, this but right here in verse 8 is definitely not good. The priest should have kept the word of God with knowledge, reverence, and obedience. Instead, they departed from the way and therefore caused many to stumble at the law. The priest of Malachi's day had made a radical departure from God's standard originally given to Levi, causing others to stumble by their bad example and false interpretation of the law. Now in high school, Admittedly, me, my brother, and my cousins, who are also pastor's kids, are sort of bullies in our youth group. We love to play pranks on our fellow young people to the point that we a conference in Kantuan, in Tripan, we have a young people, that he cried. And while he was crying, foaming, and filled with tears, he said, You are stumbling blocks. Pastor's kids, panaman kamu. But looking back, I'm not proud of what we did. But to think, pastor's kids, while they have a spiritual training at home, doesn't automatically make them godly saints. In fact, sila pa ng pinakadimunyo, ganit ang isa sa simbahan. They are one of the worst sinners in our churches and they need God's grace as much as any child would do. But if this is said of our spiritual leaders, now it's one thing for pastor's kids to be stumbling blocks. It's automatic. Feeling ko dumas auto, 
amo na gani dapat ipamin sa ronyo kay pastor skid siya amo na gani gastambling gakastambol ka mo but if this is said of our spiritual leaders that your pastor has caused many in your church to stumble by the way they teach surely there is something wrong and the people of God would be in trouble so the priest's attitudes and actions set a bad example for the people. They have abandoned their true calling both to teach and practice the truth. Instead of turning away people from iniquity, they, are, they actually are leading the people off the true path. That's why Nehemiah, speaking of the Levites and the son of the high priest, who violated God's law in a widespread and an unashamed manner, he said, God, remember them because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. What is desecrate? They have defiled, they have profaned, they have violated the office of being a priest. And how many of our pastors today ought to be this? God remember them because they have defiled the office of being a pastor. Instead of leading your people in the truth, instead of leading your people in holiness, they are the ones who are causing people to stumble, not only the way they teach, but the way they live. Now, how did this priest not keep God's ways? One is failing to obey and honor God in the sacrifices, but specifically here, verse 9, God said, inasmuch as you do not only keep my ways but also show partiality in your instruction don't only violate my law you're also biased possibly the priests are favoring society's rich and powerful people as the at the expense of the poor and the powerless they may have interpreted the law differently for the rich and poor or have put it in force against the poor and not against the rich so, the priest's task is not only to offer sacrifices and to teach, but, the, but many times they're also the judge for many cases. So God said, you have shown partiality. You have favored the rich against the poor. And it would include actual bribery. But there are many more direct offenses against equal justice. So what will God do? Verse 9, And so I make you despised and abased before all the people. Consequently, the, the worst shame and degradation fell upon them. They've made the table of God contemptible so God would repay them measure for measure. The way you offer your sacrifices, I will also now put you to shame and cause you to be hated by the people. So now our last lesson here is this. God does not only hate the spiritual leaders who fail to follow the mutual responsibility of obeying Him with all their hearts, but the people will also hate them. Because the priests of Malachi's day fell so far short of God's ideal for them, the people held them in contempt. The punishment here fits the crime. Because they despised or they hated and failed to give honor to the Lord's name, they will be despised and be abased before all the people. So it's not only God hating them. God said, I will make the people also to hate you now understand this there will be spiritual leaders who will be hated for telling the truth and living seriously according to god's truth man will generally love darkness more than light even your deacons or even your fellow elders there are people there are pastors and preachers who will be hated by men for christ's sake and that's a good hatred Anomalisus, your reward is great in heaven. On the other hand, there will also be spiritual leaders who will be loved because they did their job well and they are worthy to be given honor. Blessed are those leaders who are in that situation. That's 1 Timothy 5. They're worthy of double honor and many pastors are receiving that honor. Praise God. 
But in this case, spiritual leaders who failed to obey God with all their hearts and failed to do their responsibilities will not only be hated by God, but also by the people. Now, such dynamics is best described to be a strained relationship. Why not? And sometimes this relationship, there is no going back. It's not healthy. It's not loving. Now, my teacher said, the moment my people tells me how to do my job, ako nga pastor, kung tudluan pa ko nila, ano ubrahon ko, that's the moment I should leave that church. Why? They do not want to be led. Sila nang gusto mag-leader. Hindi, kung kabuloma lang ka mo gali, ikaw ka muna lang di pastor, masirit na ko. But I realized here that the moment that I cannot also do my job well and I'm not living right as a spiritual leader, that's the moment that I should seriously consider leaving this work and doing something else. And especially, ano na, ang, ang advice amon, if you want to make people happy, sell ice cream. Don't be a pastor. Because ice cream makes people happy. Being a pastor does not because you would step on many toes. But with the way you teach and the life that you live, if you fail to do that, I think one of the most pitiful situation to fall in, survival of the fittest. And I've seen many pastors enduring the position or their work because they have nowhere else to go. They know deep in their hearts their mem- his members hate him and he also hates his member back, but he has nowhere else to go. So Sunday after Sunday, aguantahanay. Kung sino una maka, hindi ka batas, siya lalakap niya eh. But here is the consequence. God will not only hate the spiritual leaders who failed, but he will make the people also to hate them. Because people can, can only endure so much. That's what I want to tell you, and this is what God will do. So to close this morning, what is one of the root causes of our empty and unacceptable worship to God? And what is the kind of spiritual leadership that displeases or pleases God? Dua lang ito ng application subong. Number one, spiritual leaders set the tone for pleasing and acceptable worship to God by preserving and promoting God's word with their teaching and godly lives. Spiritual leaders set the tone for pleasing and acceptable worship to God. Why? Failure to do so displeases God and will result to His rejection and His punishment. Unacceptable and empty worship starts at the top. First with the priest, then it will go down to His people as a whole. That's why the thrust of this section in chapter 2 verse 1 to 9 is negative because these priests failed. But he reminded them of the covenant he made with Levi and the godly example set by Aaron and Phinehas, their ancestors. Spiritual leaders set the tone. So if we fail to preserve and promote God's word, the church's worship will almost, also most likely be empty and unacceptable. Because what we give importance to will also be important to the congregation. So to my fellow spiritual leaders, to my fellow elders, let us preserve and promote God's word with our teaching. Let us be serious in this task. But more importantly, we should preserve and promote God's word with our lives. That when the people look at us, they will see the reality of His truth being lived out. That is where the truth is at its clearest. That's why I want to end with this verse by reading together Ezra 7 10 ready begin for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel now Ezra is more known for being a scribe but actually he's one of the descendant 
one of the descendants of Aaron and Phinehas the high priest. So Ezra's task was not only to be a governor and to copy the law of the Lord, he is actually a descendant of the priestly family. But what he did here is actually a very good example for all spiritual leaders. He does not only teach it, but it starts with his heart. He had set or purposed his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it. So you cannot teach what you do not study. And you could, not, you could not teach what you also failed to do. And this is the perfect balance of a godly leader. A perfect balance of a very godly example for all the people to see and to follow and strive for. May we all follow Ezra. Which actually, there is a theory that says Ezra is actually Malachi. I think Malachi could possibly be a generic name. This could possibly be Ezra. But there's one pastor by the name of Donald Campbell. He tells a story that not long ago, a well-meaning group of laymen came to him from a neighboring church. They wanted him to advise them on some convenient and painless method of getting rid of their pastor. So, Pastor, what's the most convenient and painless way of getting rid of him? He's afraid, however, that he wasn't much help to them. At that time, he had not the occasion to give the matter a serious thought. But since then, he has pondered the matter a great deal. And he said the next time anyone comes to him for advice on how to get rid of a pastor, here's what he said he'll tell the person. Number one. Look the pastor straight in the eye while, he, while he's preaching and say, Amen once in a while and he'll preach himself to death. Number two, pat him on the back and brag on his good points and he'll probably work himself to death. Number three, rededicate your life to Christ and ask the preacher for some job to do. Pastor, preferably some lost person you could win to Christ teach the good news, and he'll die of a heart failure. Or, and lastly, get the church to unite in prayer for the preacher, and he'll soon be so effective that some larger church will take him off your hands. What's his point? Now, this is actually sarcasm, but the reality is many churches and congregations don't like their pastors. Either he is doing his job well, because he is speaking and living out the truth that they hate him for it. You hate your pastor for doing his job so well. Or he fails miserably that they want him gone. pastor, admittedly, and he should be doing something else. And sadly, ang damo, manibang tawag ni sa mga ano sa una kay grabig sila kadedikado. Lord, ihalad namun amun bata sa imo, bisan salin salin na lang. Re rejected sa university lima na kakurso gin kwa wain sa kantuan so mapastor na lang sa kuno salin nga na lang gani hindi gani ka hindi ka gani tunlon sa kalibutan now which of the two situations are you in now this pastor's point in, in this advice is this encourage your pastor Support your pastor. Do the work of the ministry alongside your pastor and pray for him because this is no easy position and not an easy work to do. Now, I'm not the kind of person who needs a pat in the back as fuel for me to go on because whether you like it or not, whether you will help or not, I will go on serving God by His grace until He leads me elsewhere or make me stop altogether. Uh, grab driver tayo. But surely this position that I hold in the work that I do as your leader needs a lot of your prayers for God's protecting and sustaining grace. So whether you encourage me or not, whether you help me or not, it doesn't matter. But I do need your prayers. So, that's why B.B. Warfield said, and I like what he said, a minister must be learned. He must know things on pain of being utterly incompetent for his work. 
And it's sad that many pastors are incompetent for the work that they do. It's either by design or pure laziness. Taman sila magtoon. Or they don't find the time to learn or to grow in their study. But he said before and above being learned, a minister must be godly. Because nothing could be more fatal, however, than to set these two things over against one another. They should not fight. It's not one or the other. Recruiting officers in the army do not dispute whether it is better for soldiers to have a right leg or a left leg. Soldiers to run well should have both. So let us be both learned and godly ministers of Christ to set the tone. Why? If you're learned but not godly, it's useless. Tikalun ka ng klase pastor. But just being, just because you're godly and you do not study or you're not learned, it's not it's an excuse. You will bore your people out. Okay, naming example si pastor, you're you're worthy of our following, but we don't understand what, what the words coming out of your mouth. Si rush hour no. That's why Griffith Thomas said it best. Somebody, yeah, pastors, think yourself empty, read yourself full, write yourself clear, and pray yourself keen. What is he saying? Our spiritual leaders should be humble, always study and learn, communicate well, but never forget to live it out and be dependent on God always. Weird, no? Empty. But make yourself full. Be clear, but never forget to pray. Because spiritual leaders set the tone. If we can be pleasing and acceptable to God with our worship, it starts at the top. And we can never do this unless our leaders will preserve and promote God's word with their teaching and godly lives. I realize worship and teaching is connected because what we teach here will also affect the way we, we worship. You cannot, you cannot spike up or hype up a people with worship, but you fail to teach them. And this is what many churches do. They will jump up and down. They will sing for an hour or two. Then ang preaching ano lang, 15 minutes. So they were there hyped up for two hours going home empty-headed. Nabalhasan sila, naging emotional sila, ligid-ligid pa sila sa, 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 sa loob. But no value. But what will set the tone for our worship is, should start with our leaders. So pray for your leaders. Encourage your leaders. Support your leaders, but more importantly, pray for them. And lastly, where our spiritual leaders fail, we can only be saved, sanctified, and perfected by our ultimate high priest, who is Jesus Christ. Now, while this, this does not mean that God will not hold the human spiritual leaders accountable, because spiritual leaders will fail, more or less some more serious than others and God will hold them accountable but it does mean that all the human weaknesses and failures of our leaders point to the need for our perfect permanent and ultimate high priest which is only fulfilled in Christ where our pastors fail us where these priests fail them it points to their need that this perfect high priest is what we need and that is only fulfilled in Christ. That's why Hebrews says it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest who is Christ. What is he? He is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. That's why God has to make sure that the animals you bring is not blind, lame or mutilated. You bring your best because this priest that is coming will offer the best of sacrifices. He will be holy, 
innocent and unstained. That's why he has no need, like those high priests in the Old Testament, to offer sacrifices daily, first for himself and then for the sins of the people. Since Christ did this once for all when he offered himself up on the cross. But the difference of Christ is this. The law appoints Levites, Aaron, into this position in their weakness as high priest. But what appointed Jesus to be the perfect priest is through God's promise. That's why he is a better priest. No wonder verse 25 says, Consequently, Christ is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. So, Christ is able to save you. Christ is able to sanctify you. Christ is able to perfect you because he is our ultimate perfect high priest. So will you come to Jesus, your permanent and perfect high priest? Those who draw near to God through him, he is able to save them to the uttermost. If you look at us, your leaders, even though we will try to our best to live a godly life, we also need to draw near to God through Him as much as you do. Because ultimately, what will save me, sanctify me, and perfect me is my ultimate high priest who is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have appointed in your church and among your people that there will be leaders and these leaders would set the tone for what it is to live a life that is pleasing with you the way we seek your word we study your word and the way we intentionally obey you willingly obey you lovingly obey you will also set forth the tone by which we teach your people and exemplify it before your people so that acceptable and pleasing worship will happen in your church. May it start from the top. I pray that you would challenge us, your leaders, to be godly, not only with our teaching, but most importantly, with our lives. I pray that we will never get tired of learning, of growing in the study of your truth, to be ready in it always, to be humble, to be prayerful, to be dependent on you always, so that it would produce in us a sense of godliness that your people here can see and savor and will be challenged to follow and will be challenged to thirst after you as much as we also thirst after you. I pray, Lord, that your leaders here will please you and will set the tone for what it is to worship you. But thank you, Lord, that in our weakness and in our failure, you can point us to Christ, our ultimate high priest, who alone is able to save us from our sins, who alone is able to sanctify us daily, and who alone is able to perfect us, to present us blameless, to stand before your presence, because he always lives to make intercession for us on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for the high priest that we have in Christ Jesus. And for those of us who don't have this relationship with him yet, I pray that you would draw them near to you and that they would respond to you by drawing near. We thank you for your word this morning. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.